doing? We're recording now, so careful what you say. Anybody have a credit card number they'd like to say? A social security number? Okay. First announcement, that's right. One, two, three, four, five. What's this? You gotta look in the back. I said I have an ex-boyfriend's phone number. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Who among us? But <laughs> um, so you all did the formative assessment. Thank you. You all got a hundred percent credit. I don't get hundred percent credit though because when I put the answers together, I had a wrong choice. One of you pointed out to me today. Thank you. This was one of the questions, and the question was, where are you sending commands to? The system recorded it to be as argon is the correct answer, but that is incorrect. It's the notebook site, IDAS. And each of you, I believe, caught that and answered it correctly. Just the answer key was off. So I apologize to you for that. I want to make that point. But I hope the point of the exercise made you focus on what we talked about last week, which was, you have to remember what, where on the at, after the at sign is your clue, right? If it says argon there, you know you're good. If it says something like this, you're not so good, right? Okay, how's argon going? How many of you have had four letter words you've used to describe it this week? Yeah, it sucks, right? So here's the thing. I have this internal debate in my head. And it, well, actually, it's wonderful. Once you get to know and love it, it's one of these types of people, like I mentioned ex-boyfriend before, you know, some of them you have to get to know, really get to know before you come to appreciate them. And Argon is that guy, right? <laughs> right? So, so it's not the ex-boyfriend. It's not the ex-boyfriend. Well, like Argon, though, unlike the ex-boyfriend, Argon won't wrong you. Argon changes, but in predictable ways. What's that? <laughs> That's it, that's it. You know, and, and sometimes I'm not looking for, we're not looking to like speed date Argon, and Argon is not like a one-time thing. Argon is like a perpetual thing, okay? So let's just think of it that way. But I have this, <laughs> this is going sideways quick. The, the, I know, they're my children. Actually, no, they're not my children, but they're my family, I'll put it that way. Um, God, I'm going off the track. Let's get real here. <laughs> I have this struggle in my head because Nathan actually prevented, pre you showed me a shell script that made Ar submitting to Argon a little bit easier. And I said, no, 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 I don't want the students to do that because, and I quote, I believe I quote my own memory, I want them to struggle with this. And here's why. This is the tough part as a teacher, right? Especially when you have to live with Hoffman, right? Right, like I do, where you know she's got these nice handouts and materials and everything. <laughs> if I made handouts and materials in Argon, I did that in 2020, and by 2021 they were out of date because Argon changes, right? And then if I give you those materials or I give you a shell script and Argon changes, well the shell script won't run anymore or the materials won't be valid anymore. So what I'm trying to teach you is the foundation of Argon, and so what I wrote down was the struggle is the point. I know that mm -hmm. sucks. But we all go through this learning curve when we're trying to use the high performance computing systems. I will not, I promise you, I will not be punitive to you. I will not hold it against you. And please do not look in the mirror and think the problem is you, right? We all have the same issue with doing this, including me. I've been using these systems, I think I said like 20 years. I was at Illinois. Uh, there's like the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, all the web browsers, site NCSA. That's Illinois, that's where I went to grad school. I used it way back when, and I still have these issues because all the nuances and idiosyncratic things, but you can't keep up with all of it. But what you can learn is the basic system function, how to connect to it, and how to run commands on it, and that's the point of it. So I'm trying to give you some motivation here and trying to also tell you that if you struggle with it, you're probably not only not alone, you're in probably the complete majority. Like, I, plural, not a plurality, like, we are all struggling with it, all right? But give it a chance. You might learn to like him or her or whomever. I don't know. Um, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. I respect everybody. And Argon, I, I respect less because it's not a person. <laughs> but I use Argon. It is a tool. It's like getting mad at a hammer or something like that. 
All right. OK, so that's that. Um, one other point I'd like to make is in the Argon file the, um, for the homework this week, in the Argon demo system, you will note in this IRT analysis file, it's just gonna, I'm just going to pull it up locally. This is not on Argon. This lib line right here, that's a problem. Right? What lib does when you install a package is it tells R what folder to put the package in. So R has to download the package and put it in that folder and do the work it does to install it. Right? That's my directory. And even if I wanted to, as we saw last week with me trying to get you to copy things, I have to jump through hoops to allow you to have access to my directory. So when Argon will try to run this, if you tried to run this exactly without changing this line, Argon will try to install that package in my directory and it will be met with a, yeah, permission not allowed, right? It will fail spectacularly. So you will likely have to find this directory in your system in Argon, okay? That's a clue. I'm not giving you any more than that though, because again, the struggle is the point, okay? It's goal-directed learning here. Your goal, figure out where that directory is on your system. The breadcrumbs are right here, right? <laughs> Mine is in the R folder. I'm guessing you have an R folder. Check that folder. That's all, okay? Are we good? Okay. Now, that's why I also gave you two weeks for homework. And I know some of you started, because I've, I've, I've heard from some of you. I've gotten some emails from Argon. <laughs> <laughs> not pointing on any fingers but you know <laughs> it's okay actually that's why I think I showed you my email right I showed you I have an HPC folder so even if you send me emails I'll know who's sending it because it has your Hawk ID on it I'll know when you're working but it doesn't bother me because I have I have it all sent apart from that if you don't want me to know when you work or what you're doing change the email how's that sound all right <laughs> what's that look for now, I did do that, though. I do think the data analysis job folder, this new one has put your email here, at least. So I did change that part. I just didn't change the template in all the places. So if you've made that mistake, you're not alone again, right? And you're not the problem. I'm the problem. All right. Or Argon's the problem, maybe? I don't know. All right. Any questions for me? Okay, remember, this is a new format for me. I'm used to having a little bit more structure, and this is more like, I'm gonna do the lecture, we're gonna talk about it, and then we're gonna dive into the discussion. That first chapter of Bartholomew, Knott, and Mustaki, which to me is, I, I enjoyed that book, how about you? Uh, but then um, we'll get into the coding activity. And again, the coding is much more hands-off, like you try to figure it out. Yes, Sergio. So the, the question I have is, is there a particular reason to try and use Argon aside from it just not backing up your own device? Because it seems like the amount of time it took to run the analysis was the same amount of time, if not slower, than if I just ran it on my laptop. Correct, correct. The point will be, soon we will get to places that will take very large amounts of memory or a very long time to run. And having an, an Argon is a system built with redundancy for power, redundancy for space. It doesn't back up your home directory, but otherwise it's a professionally, it's, it's going to keep running. So in addition to not clogging up your own device, like if your device needs to update or restart or somehow blue screens or whatever, right? Kernel dump, whatever it is, kernel panic, right? Um, you lose four hours of progress where it's gonna keep going in Argon. Um, the other part of it is when you get to simulation studies, uh, where most of, a lot of our quantitative research is simulation based, um, you can start doing 80 replications, 100. I don't think there's an upper limit to how many jobs it can run, or how many. It'll take a while, because it'll just do five at a time. And just keep saying well, there, there are certain ways that you can get it to run a lot all at once. I've had, I've had students do like 80 at a time, 80 single reps before. So if you had 10,000 total replications in your whole study, doing 80 at a time will move that really fast. So the high th uh, what we call the high throughput makes a big difference. And then finally, for the high performance, now, most of the models we're going to do in here, I'm sorry, the high performance really isn't going to matter to our models more than just time because they're coded in a way that won't take advantage of the full system like GPUs and so forth. But if you do any machine learning, you do any, um, some of the new stuff that shows up in Python, PyMC or some of the other things. By the way, I'm on a podcast uh, for Bayesian next week anyway. 
Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe so long as COVID doesn't interrupt it, it's canceled twice, but still. Um, that thing, uh, that will really be a benefit too. So like you want to train your own large language model? Nathan, you tried that, right? So yeah, go do that. So, okay, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, for most, and here, let me also yeah. tell you my, my own little personal workflow. For most of what I do, it's not on Argon because you see there's a price to transfer it to Argon. It takes some time. You have to have a job file. But for things that are gonna take longer than a couple hours, I start moving to Argon. And some of the models that we could run in this class could take eight, 10, 12 hours. Let Argon handle it. Especially if you get to hour 10 and something happens on your computer. I've had that happen. I've had an analysis run three weeks before. Said it finished and then had an error in the output and didn't output anything. That was M plus. Yeah, thanks. Anyway, other questions? Yes, Annette. Um, for your office hours, you're in your, are you in your physical office here? I am in my physical office, although I will allow, I will, if you shoot me an email ahead of nine o'clock in the morning, yeah. I can pop on Zoom for that. Okay, that no, makes I, sense? I wanted to come. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Good sorry. I am in person. <laughs> I will be in person unless I announce that something happened and I'm not here. I keep having to say that because I feel like the first two weeks of the semester everything is happening. But um, I plan to be here. But if you don't, you don't have to be here. I can again, just to everybody, if you want to pop in on office hours, just you gotta you gotta let me know that you're looking to do that and. The best way to do that is email me before 9 a.m. on Friday. That will know to pop on Zoom. It's hard to have Zoom on otherwise, for me at least, like sitting in the background and yeah. whatnot. All right. Cool. Anything else? How about some slides? So again, I'm going to the, to find out where I'm going, my quick links, our course site right here, it pops up <coughs> this GitHub page. That's what I'm intending to be most of where you can find everything for going on that week. Uh, I go down to week three and I have lecture slides. I've created also a handout in the lecture. So I remember last year I used Quarto to build my slides and the handouts kind of sucked. Uh, like it was hard to print them to PDF. But now I figured out how to like just compile Quarto into Word and then Quarto into the, the slides themselves. And so there's a Word file that you can download. So here, this is literally the bullet points of the slides. So you can use that and take notes on it if you want. You don't have to. Cool? All right, so lecture slides. Here we go. Hope this is recording. These are things we already know, should already know. This is a really advanced class. I've had many of you in other classes. You've, most of you, if not all of you, have taken like factor analysis and IRT. So this is just me putting all that in the context of where you can get to hear me talk about it with my words, but I'm gonna do so with our, our data set example. So it's the other note I needed to make. You see the homework for this week involves downloading or copying a data set from the shared folder, right? If you are a person who copied that data set before last weekend, you'll have to recopy it because I noticed the Q matrix does not have item numbers, it has hash codes of item numbers, so I fixed that. It will not affect your results for your analysis. You don't have to redo anything, but going forward, just download the data before we go forward again. So we're gonna talk about these data sets, and I'm gonna use that as what we are going to build this multidimensional class around. Caging us in a very real problem, in my world at least, and in many of your worlds as well. Um, then we're gonna get into Q matrices and then the latent variable models and model identification at the end. Next week, we're going to do model fit, and that's where we're going to get joint distributions. I was thinking I was going to wrap all those in together, but I remember I'm trying to do 80 minutes of lecture, and I talk a lot. So I'm going to do that. By the way, if, if I talk too fast, if you need something, if you have a question, please ask it. I'm just going to keep going. I may not ask for questions as I go through. Okay? So let's talk about your data sets. Each one of you has your own data set to work on this class. And for those of you who are auditing, um, the three the YouTube postdocs back there are Nathan. Um, shoot me an email afterwards, I'll try to get you one or I can assign a copy of it. I've made it unique to each of you. And there's a purpose for that. I want you to work together. But that doesn't mean your answers are gonna be the same. 
And that doesn't mean the contents of your data sets are gonna be the same, right? So your code that you create for yours may not work for someone else's, but that's okay, because the more you work together, the more you see how potentially multidimensional models work in practice is what I'm looking at. So where do these data come from? A large urban school district in a rectangular Midwestern state. Narrows it down, right? We can rule out Ohio, Wisconsin. Is Wisconsin the Midwest? Yeah, right. Ohio's not, Wisconsin is. So if you're in Ohio, people in Ohio say they're the Midwest. Yeah. Okay. Geographically speaking. I was gonna say, anybody from Ohio? Let's take a show of hands. Who, how many do you think Ohio is in the Midwest? Ohio's in a liminal space. Yeah. Ohio is just Ohio. Let's just Ohio's be real. It's, it's, it's just Ohio. But the rest of them, let me try to think here. What else? Uh, Missouri, is that rectangular? Probably not Missouri. Uh, not Oklahoma, you got the panhandle. Can't be Texas. But after that, everything goes sort of rectangular. So anyway, what this district is doing is giving out what's called district wide benchmark assessments, right? So a school district is preparing a set of assessments for their students to take. So the school district itself, first of all, sets something, I don't know this, by the way, I come from psychology. So me learning education has been a challenge. I wish I would learn this in school, but I'm gonna tell you what I have to learn, all right? And those of you, some of you have been teachers, like Jacinta over here, so you all know better than, than I do about this. But a district will set something called a curricular scope and sequence, right? So it's what educational standards are going through at what part of the, top, the year. Well, this district would like to assess students on their educational standards at key parts of the year that correspond to their scope and sequence in both mathematics and English language arts. And here in this case, we only have the reading data. So students would read a passage and answer questions, okay? The goal of these assessments is not accountability, it's, it's to me what the, the, the quintessential high stakes assessment is. Get students to understand, get teachers and students to understand what they know and what they don't know so they can improve in education, right? That's the goal. Okay, now I will note these are not the actual data from these assessments. They're a bootstrap copy, right? So you can't go backwards and I've de-identified everything and I've gotten permission, so all of this, but it's real data, right? I have not created this, I have not simulated it, and I've done that because, and Lisa has warned against it, let me warn to tell you this, she's like, you haven't run these data sets yet? I'm like, no. She's like, how are they gonna learn? I'm like, part of the process of doing this, like in an operational program, is to take that data and struggle with it. All right, the struggle is the point. <laughs> what is it? Uh, the obstacle is the way, there's this uh, stoic writer guy, uh, Ryan Holiday. Ever heard of him? Anyway, The Obstacle is a way. It's a good book. Try that one. Anyway, Stoic Philosophy. Never mind. That's about as deep as I get on this. But think of it this way. I don't even know how this is going to work. I don't know if these should be multidimensional assessments. I don't know anything about it. And you don't either. <laughs> but that's what we're going to use. Right? This is as ecologically valid as I could get you to an operational assessment program. Okay? All right. So when you grab your data, you can load them into R with the load function. I'm going to give a quick demo of this. So permit me to try to log in. This may or may not work. I was just yeah, stale request. You know you get stale requests? Yeah, you have to close the whole thing. I've closed the whole thing, and it keeps being stale. So it can go stale itself. Oh, yeah. What's that? I'm in, I'm in private, I'm in private, private mode, so, yeah. You know what, you want, it's because you tried to connect, it probably didn't work, and so there's some cached IP yeah. going on. And they always have to put this other crap on my computer. Anyway, all right. What's the matter? What did I do? You can try Firefox, but it's probably going to help me. <laughs> no, it worked this okay, time. Okay. It did, it did. All right, so you've got some data. Nah, never mind. I won't do it. Forget it. Forget the live example. You can you can figure it out. <laughs> anyway, forget it. Load the data with the load function. There's a temp object. This is a list, an R list. So with the dollar sign, you can see um, there's a Q matrix and there's a response matrix, right? 
The response matrix is what we know and love. In fact, I formatted it in a nice style for you. Each student is a row, each column is an item. The value is a zero, one, or missing, right? Zero, incorrect, one, correct. And if a student either didn't take the item or omitted the response, I didn't make that incorrect, I just made it missing. Cool? Is that good? <laughs> okay, here's a ver version of the Q matrix. This is actually my version of data, my Q matrix. So a Q matrix, many of you know this, not everybody, so I'll stop again and talk about it. A Q matrix is a matrix that relates items, so each row is an item, to things that you're purporting to measure, right? Sometimes called alignment, sometimes called pattern, factor pattern and factor analysis. But in my Q matrix, at the top, the columns represent each of the educational standards that were assessed with this assessment. I actually have a ninth grade assessment, none of you have a ninth grade assessment. So this is my version of the data. Yours will be the corresponding grade. It'll have a set of uh, this is like a code number, this is a standard code, I'll get to that in one slide as to how to decipher that. If a 1 appears in the Q matrix, that means that item measures that standard, right? Sort of the blueprint for how to write each item is the Q matrix itself. When, when people in this district sat down to create items for this, they looked up these educational standards based on this district's scope and sequence and then said, oh, we're teaching, you know, A, algebra, REI1. I don't know what that is, but sure enough, we gotta assess it, so they wrote items specifically to that standard. How many of you have written items to standards before? Yes. So, some of you have, right? Indirectly. Indirectly, right? How many of you have heard about that before? <laughs> All right, cool. Now, yes, question. I can see that most of these items are represented under one of the standards. That's right. So is it possible to have the same item under multiple of the Yeah, absolutely. So the Q matrix is just an indicator matrix. We haven't got to the model yet. We will get there. But this actually gets to the point I was trying to make a couple of weeks ago, or which was we we're always told the good item is an item that measures one standard. And actually every standard every item in your Q matrix will only measure one standard. But that doesn't have to be that. Sometimes we call that simple structure, where there's one factor per item, or it's, uh, within item unidimensionality, sometimes we call it that way. Right? But it doesn't have to be that way. You could write an item, for instance, maybe it's a word problem in math that measures whatever A, R, E, I, 1 happens to be, and perhaps reading for information, this R, I right here. Right? So you could envision an item that required both math and reading to be able to have a good chance of answering it correctly. Not only that, um, I would say the curricular standards are pretty low of a level because most assessment programs do not write items to standards or do not assess at the standard level, do not report scores at the standard level. It's really what I should be saying. Right? I once put a bid in on a rectangular states assessment program <laughs> and we were looking for vendors to help us write items just to provide some more information. And we interviewed several very prominent vendors that write items in the world, in our educational world. And we said, show me how you'd write a set of items, set of items to measure this specific standard. And they couldn't think, uh, or better yet, show me how you build an assessment that measures that specific standard. They couldn't think that way. They always were, oh, I'm gonna measure reading. No, you're measuring that part of reading. What? Like it was just mind blowing to them. So you don't see a lot of standards level score reporting, but we're gonna talk about that because that's where the magic happens, right? So without understanding that, you can't tell a student what they know or they don't know. You're just low on reading. Great, I'm low. Welcome to my world, right? How are we doing? Other questions? Okay. So, um, latent variables. Now we're gonna start to talk about a model, but latent variables are built by specification. Except in one case. If all you're doing is unidimensional models, like if in IRT, if all you did was one theta, right? That's a specification, but it's sort of an afterthought. Everything everything's measures it. It's all, th all one, no big deal. It's when you go from one to two where that spef specification really matters, right? 
So if you think about building it, uh, you could specify a latent distribution, latent variable, by not only what items it purport to measure it, I should say, but also uh, what the distribution of a latent variable is. In the reading this week, they talked about distributions of latent variables, right? Like that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Everything is constructed with the specification. We are building these latent variables themselves, right? We're not just defaulting to everything's unidimensional. We are putting effort in to try to separate them and, and, and build them. So if they are, everything is uh, normally distributed, then usually there's a mean and the standard deviation. We'll have to get to that later. Um, so first of all, most of the latent variables and then almost everything, actually in this class, we're gonna change it up just like that chapter did. Uh, we'll have some categorical, we'll have some continuous latent variables. But um, if you think about um, the latent variables, the more important part though is this Q matrix, right? That really specifies which item measure which, which standard. In fact, many people call this face validity, right? The alignment. And if you go and look at um, each state assessment program for accountability has to pass uh, a federal government peer review process. A huge part of that peer review process is alignment. How do you know that your items are measuring what they purport to measure? So that, this, is, this is the first part. The Q matrix is, to me, the first part of the latent variable uh, specification and a key part of your validity argument for your assessment as well, too. All right, so these, this Q matrix is called different things. Alignment, factor pattern matrix, Q matrix. The Q, term Q matrix actually comes from diagnostic models. It came from uh, Maurice and Kakumi Tatsuoka. And uh, well, actually, uh, Dr. Dunbar actually cites a reference, I think, to Stevens before then, that I know it of uh, the Tatsuokas. And those of you who are in uh, Dunbar's class, you can ask them, where, where did the Q matrix come from? See if you can get, a, get, a, get, get that other reference. I don't doubt him. I've heard that before also in other contexts. So I know it from the Tatsuokas. Well, let's talk about this Q matrix for a bit. Those codes at the top, those are standards codes. They all have meaning. I didn't know this when I was in I didn't know this until I started working at Kansas the second time <laughs> when I was in education. But basically, this is common core-like. Remember back uh, 15 years ago, everybody was trying to do these common core standards, then there was this sort of political backlash to it, so all the states decided they weren't going to do Common Core, they were just going to make a copy of it and rename it, except for Texas. Texas never really did anything, but <laughs> the Common Core itself, most states are like that, the state that we're at is a Common Core derivative, so this, the coding system seems very familiar. But in mathematics, the first number is the, the grade level, the second is the domain. So in domains in mathematics, these are levels above standard. You've got standard, those standards are nested within a domain. So in this case, OA is operations and algebraic thinking. So this is a third grade mathematics standard. So you'd expect this to be in taught in the third grade. It involves al operations, algebraic think thinking, and it's the fifth standard of that set. Right? So the whole code itself is specifying a very specific type of um, uh, process in math. So if I do, if I just did 3.0a.5, uh, let's see if I can find it. Oh, here's some real world math tasks. Nope, that's not. Uh, super teacher worksheets. Here we go. Apply properties of operations as strategies to multiply and divide. All right. So this is the type of work that goes into that standard, right? There's a ton of standards. Like each grade could have 30, 40 math standards. Maybe not math all entirely, but 30 or 40. And so anyway, that's math. When you get to high school math, remember grades stop mattering as much in high school, but you'll get a category, like in this case functions, a domain, and then the standard number itself. Right? So you'll see, might see that on my, on my slide, you saw A, that was algebra. That was the first letter of some of those math standards. For each of your data sets, your math standards will start with a number, three. Then when you get into English language arts, in particular reading, 
the reading standards will start with an RI or an RL. And the difference between the two is RI is reading for information. So man user manuals, tax preparation guides, <laughs> nonfiction, right? And then RL is reading for literature, fiction. I'll put it that way, right? Stories. Uh, and you can imagine, uh, of course, they have a grade range. And then the standard number itself shows up. That standard number is, is what of that set. If you go and look at the set of math standards and compare it to the set of reading standards, you'll, something really big will pop out if you look across grades. The reading standards are really repetitive, right? One of the, uh, one of the very first standards, particularly in the younger grades, is identify the main character if it's reading for literature. Right? So you'll see that at third grade. You'll see that at fourth grade. You'll see that at fifth grade. If it's reading for information, identify the main point of the passage. Right? It's sort of parallel structure. So what that actually implies is that the standard itself is not really looking at reading. It's actually looking at how you understand text at a different grade level. So that's a different thing altogether. Whereas math, math is very much like we all experience in trying to learn math. It's segmented, but also structured in the way that builds upon itself. So each of the standards are sort of like prerequisite for later on, for most of them, although they're branches to it. How'd I do with that, former teacher? Anybody, or anybody else? Who else is a teacher? How'd I do? Did I handle that okay? Me, I'm not a teacher. I mean, I guess I'm a teacher here, but not a, you know how they trained me to teach. They said, here's your class, good luck, all right? I mean, that's, higher ed for you. All right, so I just gave you the rundown of the columns. You see a set of items for each. Question for discussion, what are our latent variables? What should they be? Okay, so that's jumping right in. Let me ask maybe a different question, which is, what was the point of the assessment? Because what your latent variables are is gonna be tied to the point of the assessment. If you think about the score that you give a person, or the set of scores you give a person, that's sort of what the point would be, right? So we're, what would we like to do? We'd like to help the students learn the things they should have learned, or uh, check where their progress is on the things in the curriculum. So in that case, standards would be helpful. How many of you think standards are a good thing to assess? Cool. How many of you have seen an assessment that does standards level? Now, some of them purport to. Many of them are cheating. Because what they'll end up doing is saying, I've got a unidimensional model across the subject, like math. And then I'm going to make subscores and the standards. And we're going to see at the end of the class that's cheating and that's not multidimensional. Because when the unidimensional model happens, you've just made everything one dimensional. You've forced it on that. So dividing it up is like giving a bunch of short test scores of the same measure. Not really helpful. Let me ask this. How many of you have seen standards and test blueprints before? There. Dare I, should I look up the Iowa assessments? You can. Or is that, is that too close to the fire? Uh, I can even watch it. Test blueprints, do they have blueprints in there? Uh, no, blue pints, like that's not. shouldn't look at this. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble. Like someone's going to be like, Templum must have, there we go. Lingers like which are blueprints. Here we go. So in the blueprint itself, here's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to, by the way, this is not to criticize Iowa testing. This is to look at Iowa testing is very similar to many testing programs in the country. Right? This is not unique to Iowa testing. This is industry, industry standard for accountability at least, right? Each of these is not a standard. Let's do, let me do this. ISASP. The mathematics ones usually get a little bit more detailed. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Grade three, numbers and operations in base 10. If I go back to this document, you will see Numbers and operations in base 10, NBT, that is a standard code. 
right? So if we're disentangling what's happening in a test blueprint, you'll see it right there. That's a cue, clear clue right there that the three NBTs will be assessed in that, that test, and it's going to account for somewhere between 11 and 14 percent of the items, right? Each one of those different domains will map onto domains in mathematics. So what I'm trying to get you to think about here is, Annette, you said we should assess the standards. Like we should give standards scores. Yeah, you, you oh, did. Oh, okay, okay. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the tape. In the context of, <laughs> of our data. <laughs> sure. In the context <laughs> of our data. So I'm going to ask the question. If standard scores are important for learning, and blueprints of assessments like this involve standards, why don't we provide scores for standards multidimensionally? In the assessments that we're building in a large scale sense. In this case. Too difficult and nobody. Uh, and Too difficult? Okay, poor reliability. Maybe? Poor reliability. Let's keep going. Sounds good. I'm just asking. I'm trying to have a discussion here. I'm trying to make you think about this is the world. In particular, the world I walked into is what the hell is going on? You've got like a blueprint, a Q matrix that you built, and then you just go, eh. My Q matrix is a column of ones. Everything's math. The end. Right? That's maybe may or may not be good. I would go with this more diplomatically to say the point of this assessment is to try to get a sample of what students might know about third grade math, because it's not for student learning, it's for bullshit purposes. I said that. It's for accountability. This technically should be a low stakes assessment. Right? Because it doesn't matter to the test taker at all whether they actually score well on it. Right? So in many ways, all of that is kind of garbage. So that's the argument I make. How many, anybody want to dis disagree? Please disagree. Yeah, yeah, it's federal law. It's accountability. But that's getting back to where I first started. What's the purpose of the assessment? This one's accountability. And they are following that. They are meeting it. They pass peer review. So I'm not criticizing what's happening. It's just, what's the purpose of our assessment? Instruction, right? Now, later in the class, we'll talk about whether an assessment that is built for instruction can also serve an accountability purpose. The answer is absolutely yes. The way people think about it is pretty stupid or naive. Right? Can I throw that word out? I feel really charged today. I feel like I'm just going to be opinionated. I'm going to editorialize. It's dumb. But I like it. I'm just, I'm just on fire. I just feel like I, there's something, a, fl a switch flipped in my mind, and I'm just like becoming a bigger jerk. I can just feel it. It's like the Hulk, like a jerkness. Like, <laughs> anyway, never mind. All right. Wow, what the heck happened there? Porto <laughs> error. Okay, so what happened? The, the computer senses your being <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. I'm going to start <laughs> matting, throwing it to. What happened in class today? Template threw his computer out the window and then jumped out and screamed. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> All right. Let's calm down here. Oh, Let me get off the soapbox and talk a little bit more systematically, though. We can go from a cube matrix to a model. And that's what this is trying to do here. The first item is measuring just this RL. RL is reading for literature. Standard four from the ninth and 10th grade set of standards, right? That indicates that if we were to build a latent variable that represented the person's ability on just that one standard, it would look like something like this. This is, God damn it. Jittery over here dropping coffee. All right, there. Yes, please. I can go. I can. Oh, you have a napkin? Wow. Oh, thank you, Jacinta. You're talking to a guy who oftentimes realizes there's no towel after the shower. So, <laughs> so I'm like, I can improvise on spilled coffee. Thank you. Do you need the snow? No, we're good. Thank you. <laughs> I just saw something spell, and my mom was just, mom and me just. Oh, out. got you. Yes. I was I, like, paper towels. Okay. I should be more prepared. I shouldn't drink coffee when I'm already riled up. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the model. This is a very general form of a model. 
what it's doing is we're modeling a function of the mean of an item response with a series of a, what we call a linear predictor. And theta here would be a, a latent variable. That's just a little catch to it. I'll come back to that as we get through today. But actually, the chapter that I assigned you to read sort of hinted the two, the generalized modeling aspect of what we're trying to do. So this indicates that what you just saw on that previous page is on the left-hand side of the equation is data. Now, we take a function of a function of the data, but this data, and on the right-hand side is our latent variable. And that first slide I put up in class, which I give everywhere, it's like saying this is the theory built by our Q matrix, and this is the data of all the types. Right? So we're saying that we believe a person's latent trait, in this case the ability on RL910.4, it will impact an average score on the item for a person. That's what that's saying in some way. The function that you see here, the E is the average, that's the expected value. The F is what we would call a link function, right? So that in this case, in many cases, if it's a binary item, all your data is binary. We will use usually a logistic link function. Sometimes we use a probit. And then other times, well, there's some in the slides you'll see in just a bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, but the key here is data shows up in the equation. So that's what we call a measurement model. So again, if you're in unidimensional land and all you knew was like unidimensional IRT, you probably didn't talk about measurement models. Because first of all, there was no dimensionality. And second, it was only measurement models. The structural model sort of disappeared. This notation of measurement model, to me, where I learned it was the structural equation modeling literature, right? So in a measurement model, it's where items and uh, data, pardon me, data and latent variables appear together in a model, right? That's what a measurement model is. So this right here, here's data, here's a latent variable. It's telling you basically this latent variable is being measured by that data right there. That's what's happening. Sorry about the, oh. the, the move over here and not just spill my coffee. Okay, so observed variables. So basically, the measurement model is the relationship between observed and latent variables. Observed variables are the items, latent variables are the things that we define with our measurement itself. So today, the model is supposed to say all model the expected value or the mean of latent variables. Right? That's a func that's the E function. There are classes of models that are super cool that some of you know that I talk about. Uh, and that you also get in other classes like Hoffman, where we might model also the variance. Or we might model, we have multiple variables, covariance or correlation. All those are super awesome and super cool. They fall under a heading of uh, location and scale models. You don't, we won't talk about those in this class though. Okay? All about the mean on this side. All right. Okay. First set of models to talk about, binary IRT models. These are pretty much going to be what you use in class because we all have binary data. Binary data, first of all, we've got to talk about a distribution of the data. A great distribution to use is a Bernoulli distribution. In fact, I don't know of another distribution for binary data. So Bernoulli is it for me. Maybe there are others. There have to be others. But my own naive reading stays here with Bernoulli. It's a great thought question, logically. Uh -uh. No. Infinite sample space. No. Yeah. But Bernoulli uh, takes values that are 0, 1. This function that you see up here is the uh, probability mass function, or PMF, sometimes referred to as PDF, which is more of a continuous measure, uh, probability density function. It's a distribution function. It tells you how likely it is to observe some y, right? There's one parameter, it's pi, right? So each item in this case would have a probability. If a person got an answer right, that would be their likelihood, the probability they got it right. It's like, so that's like a classical item difficulty. Uh, and then there's one minus that probability, or the converse of it, getting it wrong. And so if somebody were to get it wrong, you'd say that's the probability that they would have gotten it wrong, right? So it's just a simple function itself. The key here, though, is pi is the expected value. So that's the thing we model. 
and that's where we put our IRT model. All right, so here, the expected value, another way of kind of calling this is the probability that y equals one, and this, I just decided to put four parameters in. One of you will show me up with a fifth, <laughs> but, sorry, <laughs> giving side eyes over, uh, but I thought I'd stop at four because, you know, that's plenty. We're not gonna use all four most likely, but this is the unidimensional IRT model that you're used to. Uh, item difficulty is B, item uh, in discrimination is A, theta is your person's ability, C is a lower asymptote or pseudo-guessing parameter, and D is an upper asymptote. It should not be discrimination parameter. That, that is not appropriate. But, um, exactly, <laughs> ironic, well, no, no. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 the parameter is the carelessness parameter. Do you think I can, can I, can I do this? No, I don't think I can. It's almost like what I said. Oh, this is really nice for me to achieve, but I said it in such a way. Oh, they won't let me. This is a university computer, and I can't go in and change the HTML for it. Otherwise, I'd change it on the slide. Anyway, all right. So several notes about this. Only one dimension here, because you're used to seeing that. We're going to get to multiple dimensions in just a bit. Um, next, logistic link function is what we use. It's the this right here, this term in the parentheses is what we call the inverse logit. It takes a continuous number and maps it back onto a probability. And why we use that is because the probability, because this number can either be zero or one, we know the mean has to be between zero and one, right? So we have to, to model that mean without having other difficulties, we usually convert it to a number that can be on the real number line. So that's what this, the logit function does. This is the inverse. It takes a number from the real number line and maps it back over. This should be familiar to most of you. Cool. Now, we didn't have to use logit. Uh, I just went through and put a few in here. How many of you have, like probit, normal objives? Uh, logs, anybody? Okay, how about log log? I kid you not, that is a link function. And if you, if you really like log log, you can have the cumulative version or the complementary version. <laughs> All of those are versions of link functions all of them have a little bit different features. And if you don't believe me, go find Wikipedia, all right? Or better yet, SAS Proc Mix user manual. Proc Glimix, Proc Glimix. All right, so that form of IRT was probably what you saw in your IRT classes when you first learned IRT, but we're gonna throw it away. <coughs> we're not gonna use it anymore because everything we're gonna do is in this form, which is called slope intercept form. Slope intercept form is useful because if you notice, I, I actually really like discrimination difficulty because it puts a really clear meaning on where the, like a location <laughs> of the item is, the difficulty itself. But the problem with that is when we have multiple thetas, this product of A times theta minus B is gonna break down. So we need to, to map it over to something that's a little bit different. This is the same model. I just changed the parameterization slightly, right? Now we have an intercept, which we call mu and a discrimination or factor loading or slope, which we call lambda, okay? You can see the transformation when theta is standardized, there's a quick, easy transformation between the each to swap between the two. I will also make the other side note, if you're in Bayes' world, the posterior distributions will be different between this model and that parameterization because you're putting a prior on different parameters and those priors will change and so that's, but that's not important to what I'm trying to get you to think. We're gonna be focusing on something that looks like this, which is a, like a linear model in the logit. Because now, when we have multiple thetas, we just add them in like they were multiple predictors in a linear model of some sort. Cool? Maybe? I don't know. Right. But what about the Q matrix? Let's put that Q matrix in. The Q matrix, can actually show up like this. So we want to leave it possible that an item measures more than one latent variable. Now, we talked about this the first time. We've always been taught from basic measurement. A good item is an item that measures, only measures one thing. But we're at the standards level. It may also be impossible to write an item that measures only one thing, particularly when you get to advanced math, 
right? Try to do, you know, chain rule and differentiation without something from algebra in it. Good luck, right? It's all algebra at that point. It's not going to work. So I have a conjecture. The more narrowly defined your latent variable is, the grain size being like standard, the harder it is to write items that only measure one thing. But that's not a bad thing. That actually is a really good thing, I think. So we want to leave it possible that our items are measuring more than one quantity. And the way we do that here is just to sum. Remember, the Q matrix entry for an item, so D is my notation for dimension in this case, or latent variable. Remember, this is a zero or a one. It's a one only if that latent variable is measured by that item. If it's a zero, then all this goes away, right? So with one latent variable, uh, there'll be one Q is one, and that latent variable will show up on the item, and the others won't, right? With, with, an, with more than one Q matrix entry is there, you'll have an additive function. You'll have lambda one times theta one plus lambda two times theta two and so forth. That seem familiar? Okay. Key thing. I put on here, not all items need to measure all latent variables. In fact, most items are only going to measure one latent variable. In fact, all of your data, every item measures one. That's okay too. All right? So, questions? Okay. How about some polytomous IRT models? Woohoo! I'll go quick through this because we're not going to cover that much. All right, but the key thing though is in model building, we gotta think about the distribution of latent variable. If you have multiple categories, right, whether you have a 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, or pick the option the person picked, A, B, C, D, like on a multiple choice item, that falls under what we call a categorical distribution. The categorical distribution is kinda, oh, this is whack, I got another typo. This should be an indicator. Here, Y should be an indicator that a person picked category C. This is, notation's terrible. Ignore the notation, I apologize. But basically, each category has its own probability. That's the key. So multiple probabilities within an item, that we know with probability, they all have to sum to one, right? Otherwise, we're just downloading somebody's R package that we don't want to use. I'm sorry. I'm hating on R. Uh, nothing will be spared from my wrath. <laughs> Anybody got a topic I can hate on? <laughs> you know, so what should that be? You said this should be an indicator function, sometimes called an Iverson function, that Y is equal to category C. But basically it's a switch, right? So this is a product across all this item's categories, probabilities, but only one of them should appear, right? So if a person picks category C, they get probability C, right? That makes sense? So when we have multiple categories, we actually have uh, what Lisa calls submodels, right? Basically, we have to model the contingencies for each category. A greater response model does that through this crazy cumulative. Uh, this is a cumulative probability right here, the probability of being uh, at that or um, above for a given category. So this is like for. Uh, we sometimes call this an ordered logistic that we use this for uh, like partial credit type items, items that have scores 0, 1, 2, 3, something along those lines. Here you'll note the key is the linear predictor for the thetas. There's a different intercept for each of the categories, minus 1. The intercepts are ordered, but the, the structure itself is the same. So if you have multidimensional model, it just maps onto that just the same. It's we, we just change the, the distribution. Then there's the nominal response model. And I, yeah, I got to tell you, like, nominal has been like, that's the shiny object that a lot of you like to, to look at. And I, I like it too. Like, who doesn't good, like a good nominal model? Nominal response model is modeling, in this case, if we had the option choice, if these were multiple choice items, we'd pick which option a student picked. And again, that's, a, that's a multiple categories. But unlike the greater response model, so I hit this. Um, the nominal response model does not have an ordering of their parameters, right? So this is an unordered logistic regression. And furthermore, each category will have its own intercept 
and its own set of loadings or slopes in this case, discriminations, for each item that is bit measured by it. Right? So remember this notation up here, the Q notes that that dimension needs a loading and a theta to show up in the model. This model gets a little bit more complicated in that we have to, we can't estimate all these things with but constraints. In particular, one constraint on the, actually one constraint per type of parameter, I should say. In this case, the mean is one, right? Sometimes we set one of those values to zero, sometimes we make the sum zero, sum to zero. And then each dimension's loadings have to have a constraint. So what do I mean by that? So if we were measuring a reading standard and a math standard, because this is a math word problem, then the reading standards would have to have either a sum to, in this case, sum to one, sum to zero, is your solution, or one set to a value. And then the reading would also have to have the same. This also brings up an interesting question. That Q matrix implies the entire item. It could be the case that you build a Q matrix that goes a bit further. In that, if you write an item, like a math item, and it has misconceptions for the options, right? You might want to measure those misconceptions. You might want to go and establish those as latent variables. Well, not all misconceptions appear for each option. So you're, you may not, you may have a very unique style, this, this generic thing here with the sum across all the Q matrix entries may not apply. Some options may have some latent variables, others may have others latent variables, and that's fine too. This is sort of an incomplete version of that. The Sikkim model? Sikkim. Yes. I actually disagree. I think from a modeling practice, it's hard enough to build the right Q matrix. And I think that every time you indicate a misconception or a latent variable, it should show up on all the options and let the data choose. Because if you impose a zero constraint on it, it's worse than allowing it to find a zero by itself, statistically. But I wanted to mention that to make the binds open up a little bit. All right, other questions? Okay, so we've covered binary data. We've covered ordinal or ordered category data, covered nominal data. How about continuous data? That's where factor analysis comes in. Yeah. Forget. <laughs> yes. The hate is strong. <laughs> Come to the dark side. This is good. Yeah. The continuous data is sort of a, a dream world for most of what we do. Most times you see factor analysis is actually ordered categories that we're working on. So just disconnect there. Um, but I do want to show this because it turns out a lot of the stuff in factor analysis is really easy to show mathematically and it gives us a clue as to what's happening when we move away from factor analysis. So factor analysis will serve a good purpose for us, just not how we use our data. <laughs> it's like this helps us understand what we're doing mathematically, particularly for you who are specializing in this field. This doesn't help us with data. Like if you're using this on liquor data, just realize that's, yes, the world does it, I do it. But like if I'm teaching you like the theory part of it, we probably shouldn't, right? So if we have a continuous, if we have Y and somehow it's continuous, we can use a normal distribution for it. There's lots of continuous distributions, but let's just say continuous and unbounded, we'll use a normal distribution. That's a normal PDF. Y itself um, then has our linear regression looking function. You'll note that this term right here showed up in every equation we've had to this part, right? So it's that, that's the theory part that I keep talking about. We got a little error term that shows up now. We have error because the, the normal distribution has a second parameter, the variance. So we need a parameter to go there. The error variance shows up there. So this error follows normal distribution. This uh, psi is often denoted in factor analysis as the unique variance for item. Yeah. Yeah. Why lambda has a uh, C there? A typo. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, this, I'm finding typos left and right on this. I apologize. Next time, I'll drink more coffee when I make the slides. <laughs> right, before class, not 
Maybe both. <laughs> Maybe both. Maybe both. The problem is when I'm done with class and I'm on this high, then I need the downers to bring myself down. And that's harder to find on a campus like this. You notice, like, there's no sedatives you can easily buy. I guess you could buy, like, <laughs> antihistamine. But you can buy any stimulant you want, right? It's Just not. go to basic goods. <laughs> I'll go somewhere. All right. That's the variance. Intercept, loading. Anyway, works the same. I don't need to dwell too much on it, right? But let's talk more about that Q matrix, shall we? I put this slide in for our multi our, our um, Bayes class last year, and I got a kick out of it because I really hate the sum, and I'm like, I can do this in a matrix. There's a matrix form to figure out the Q matrix. Hooray. There'll be lots of matrix algebra coming. Oh, it's, it's just a wonderful way of speaking. <laughs> Actually, on that note, for those of you who roll your eyes at matrix algebra, uh, there have been people in our field, one of whom I learned from, Rod McDonald, who claimed that if it weren't, like we didn't have matrix algebra well developed in like the 1800s, and they thought that that held us back from discovering more mathematics because the notation was so complex. Even though matrix algebra is really like its own layer of a language, it's like a dialect that you have to speak later on, it shortens what you can write and it makes it easier to see findings. And so there's a lot of people who find that to be very valuable and that's part of why we've made a lot of progress mathematically up to where we're at now. So just before we hate on it, let's just be real. Like it, it just sucks to learn it, right? Actually, no, I, I love matrix algebra. Those are my favorite classes, but anyway. That's the Q matrix with uh, general form. Last slide. You may be wondering, hey, I see this linear model, theta one plus, or lambda one times theta one plus lambda two times theta two and all that stuff. That's a linear model. I've seen this before. And in linear models class somewhere, you usually get into interactions. So couldn't we have a latent variable interaction? The answer is absolutely. That's just ridiculously hard to notate. So I did it for one item that measures two dimensions. But we could, right here. So interestingly, the latent variable interaction is going to play a key role in this semester, more than you realize. So there's a, there's a theorem that exists um, by Bill Stout, uh, Mark Case talks about it in his book. It basically says that if there's no latent variable interaction present, then the sum of the thetas that you would get is roughly like a proxy for a unidimensional, or uni, sorry, a unidimensional theta is like a proxy for the sum of all the thetas. And that's the excuse we use when we do a large scale assessment that's probably not unidimensional. We just pretend there's no latent variable interaction. So that pops up number one. Number two, hold on just a second. Uh, there's a whole class of models that started with latent variable interactions. Diagnostic classification models. There's an early model of that called DINA. DINA is, not pastor, is, with an I, not an E. Um, this model is only interaction, right? If it measures two things, it's like saying there's an intercept, no main effects, and only the interaction. Now, it took a while for us to understand that, but that's what that model does. So there's a whole class of fields do it. And then there's the, the other class of fields in psychology and, and, and factor analysis, these are latent vari variable interactions, but they, they do them in crazy ways. I just don't understand it. Right. Well, I do understand it, but I don't think they see the whole picture of it the way that some other people in the DCM world is. That's like the most valuable contribution of DCMs to me is better modeling of latent variable interactions. I think that's the key to it. So I know that sounds a little abstract, but that's where I see it. Viewed. But we are going to talk about latent variable interactions because in my mind, if what you're doing when you build an assessment that blueprint starts with standards, but you say they're all unidimensional, you're relying on that interaction not being present for the model to be roughly appropriate. At the time where that theorem came out, it was very difficult to get an estimate of that interaction. We're going to get that interaction in this class. We're going to estimate it, right? So we're going to test whether that theorem applies to data, and you can do that too. So I think the latent variable interaction is a key part of what we do in this class, believe it or not. Now, for items that only measure one trait, no interaction. Got to have more than one there. All right. How are we doing? Pace okay? It's quick, but I'm trying to be quick. I'm trying to confuse, not teach. <laughs> I, I know I've met, they made that mark with Argon, so. 
All right, latent variable structural models. Um, so now we're going to get into something you didn't talk about in IRT, but you talked about a lot in factor analysis, right, which is the structural model. Every latent variable has a model for the latent, uh, every latent variable model has some type of model for the latent variables themselves. Even if it's not explicitly written, it's there, right? Most of the time in this class, it will be explicitly written. We'll say the latent variables follow a multivariate normal distribution, right? So if you think about it, if we ran a four-dimensional factor analysis, we would estimate a four-dimensional covariance matrix among the factors. Now, we'd have to figure out how to identify it and so forth. But that four-dimensional latent variable covariance matrix is what we would call a saturated structural model, meaning every parameter is filled up, right? When you first learned, let's say, a two-parameter IRT model, did you ever learn the structural model in it? With Lisa. With Lisa. So that's because SEM background. But if you're in the ed measurement version of it, and I'm not going to point fingers because every single person in every place I've worked, and I've worked at a number of them, teaches IRT this way. They don't talk about structural model because it's either, well, we don't want to talk about it, or it's standardized, a standard normal for theta. If it's in the Lord book, we didn't learn it. All right. Lord's book. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was so, like two and a half so seconds. let me let me say this though about Lord. Like the eighty book is all right, uh, not my favorite. There's still <laughs> the sixty eight Lord Novick book. Mm -hmm. Novick, by the way, faculty member here at Iowa. Um, that one still has traction. If you read Burnbound's chapter on the two PL, if you read some of the way that they talk about relating thetas to classical measures, how they talk about a little bit of information or reliability in there, that's a great book still today, and that's really hard to see a book that does that hold it that well. But, yeah. One child is right Yeah. The same year, Lazarus, Feld, and Henry, oh, excellent book. 68 was a good year for books. I wouldn't know. I, I'm not that old, all right? <laughs> Close, but not that old. Um, all right. Now, those parameters in that distribution could be changed so we could use simultaneous equations, so a structural equation model. Where would you use that in, late, in measurement? Two, Each other. let's think of this. College entrance. Kids take VCT when they show up here. Sorry, I'm, on, I'm from the coast, so. SAT. SAT, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Left coast, thank you, thank you. But um, in my SAT, I forgot my ID. And I got there late. I was going to community college anyway, so I didn't matter. But if you wanted to talk about the impact of ACT on first year GPA, that's where you'd use it because ACT score has uh, unreliability, right? It's not perfectly measured. The structural equation model is trying to account for that in the model parameters it does. So a simultaneous analysis where you take ACT and predict first year GPA, if you have the raw data from ACT, the item responses, would be the way to go for it. Anyway. So is linking also a structural model? No. No, okay. Linking is is a pair of models with a series of constraints. I think you can boil it down to. Okay. There's a nice paper by uh, Von Davier, uh, Matthias, that I think even Alina might be on that paper, that talk about sort of the, the mathematical considerations of like uh, concurrent calibration versus other types of linking. Uh, and they, they boil it into a series of constraints and a likelihood. So it's a nice way of looking at it. But. All right. Uh, Here's an example. Uh, like again, this is the multivariate normal distribution. There's a whole bunch of matrices. There's a mean vector, though. That's a set of parameters and a covariance matrix. And for us, in particular, the first part of class, we're going to have our thetas be continuous and normally distributed. So that's the structural likelihood, right? And when you think about that, all this here has theta in it. How you differentiate structural from not is whether or not you see any observed data in it, mostly. We're going to stay there with it. There's, there's some nuance to it where you cross them up, but there's no data here, right? It's thetas, no observed data. It's latent variables. That's the structural model. How are we doing? All right. Last couple slides, and then we'll take a break. Um, so. This model has a covariance matrix and a mean vector in it. 
but we can't estimate all of those and all the item parameters as well. And so that brings up the idea of identification of traits. To estimate a latent trait when it's not unidimensional, we have to go and figure out empirically what the minimum number of items are to do that. I follow the CFA constraint. Three observed variables for each latent variable is a minimum. Uh, you can actually have two. So if you have five, we have a five item assessment, three can measure one factor, two can measure the other so long as the factors are correlated. I like that. The correlation, the double-sided arrow, I'm drawing a path diagram in, in my finger here. Anyway, you saw that, right? Never mind. <laughs> Chris did. Thank you, Chris. Um, that shows up there. Technically, Bayesian priors can make you think that you can get away with fewer. It's a bad idea. I don't like doing that. I like to use the CFA standard. I will say, though, from a measurement context, this is difficult because if you think about giving a student a score and you use the bare minimum of three items, there's a whole lot of error in that score, right? So, all right. The other thing we need to do is, so that's empirical identification, number one. I would actually add one more for the multidimensional case. If our traits are multivariate normal, we need to be able to invert the covariance matrix. So we need a, a um, positive semi-definite covariance matrix. What does that translate to in English? <laughs> Well, let me back up a second. In, an uninvertible matrix would be one like where you have correlation of one between a pair of variables. That's one example of a bad idea, right? That's but one example. There are other versions where this can get into and that causes a whole nightmare for estimation, right? Estimation wise, that covariance matrix has consumed so much of my life, I can't tell you. I'm serious, right? I'm real familiar with that SOB. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm on fire today. Dropping my call things bullshit. I'm like, normally, I don't like to swear in class. This class is different. Maybe because my office is there. It's just familiar. Or maybe because I'm so used to all of you, most of you at least. I know you, so I can be myself. Who am I? Anyway, never mind. <laughs> Scale identification is um, the opposite. It's literally providing what the mean, what the standard deviation of those variables are, right? One easy way to do that is standardize everything. All the mean, all the latent variables have a zero mean and a variance of one. You can estimate the covariance, but the correlation is now a correlation matrix, right? A covariance matrix with a diagonal of one is a correlation matrix. If it's positive, semi-definite. The um, other option to this is something we call marker items, right? We set a parameter or two to a value and we estimate parameters in uh, the covariance matrix itself. So if we had wanted to estimate variance for each factor, we could, we'd have to set one discrimination or loading per latent variable to a fixed value. Usually that value is one. And if you're using M plus for each latent variable, the first item it doesn't estimate its loading, it just sets it to one, and then you get a, a factor variance afterwards. I will note though, this is part of what the chapter we're about to discuss talks about with the invariant, the uh, indetermination, indeterminate, uh, factor indeterminacy, right? So in what I was just talking about, generally speaking, you know, if I decide I want marker items, and Vladimir decides he wants standardized, we just trans, we can transform from one to the other and get the same solution. Uh, with the exception of Bayes, where the posterior distribution starts to get in the way. It's close in Bayes from most prior distribution choices. All right, how are we doing? Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to end here. All right, psychometric models. That was our preview. That's my language. That was quick. That was like, how many years of study have you guys been in to be in to like me? Have me go like that. <laughs> All right. If I did that your first semester, what would you be saying? Uh, what am I getting my children to? Kind of like the Argon lecture. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, any questions for me about this? Any questions about why it appears? 
or where we're going. So the blatant interactions mm -hmm. would be, like the lambda for that, mm -hmm. would be how well do these two items measure this combination of like math and science together? This would be, yeah, this would be basically the over or under additive impact of knowing one or the, the combination of them. Okay. Right? <clears throat> when we get to diagnostic models, because diagnostic models basically discretize theta, they make uh, the most basic, make it two categories. And so we dummy code it, then it becomes very like a two way ANOVA. Right? This is going to modify our main effects. Right? We got basically have. Um, moderation here, right? And so. Well, because then what if lambda were negative, how would you know which data is making it negative? That makes sense. Well, you get those parameter estimates, but the other picture with this is, oh. if I go back to this slide over here from the first lecture, son of a gun. Oh, this happened to me before. You just have to go back to materials. Oh, thank you. Know. Sorry about that. I think it might just yeah, I gotta fix a lot of things. My bad. No, this is I'm in this week. Come on, Templin, quit being so stupid. Yeah, it only happened to me with the week one. All right, week one, I'll fix that. But there was a slide I had in here. Just download this real quick. I made a hypothetical latent variable interaction plot this one right here. And this is the ICC. But remember what, what an interaction is doing here. This Lisa Hoffman 101 will tell you what does the latent variable interaction do? It modifies the main effects. It moderates them, right? So if I wanted to talk about the main effect, this main effect is now a simple main effect, meaning it's when theta 2 is equal to 0. Right? So if the latent variable interaction modifies the main effects, and these main effects happen to be discrimination parameters, what we end up seeing is basically the discrimination parameters vary by a score on a different trait. And that's what we have here. If you have a math score, and you have a latent variable interaction between reading and math on like a word problem, what you'll end up seeing is different, different shapes of the ogive, like different how quick it moves up because of that latent variable interaction. Okay. How's that sound? I think it's the item parameters get all crazy then, right? Because again, this is now a simple slope, right? And that changes the world. It makes a world of difference in what we do. And not only that, the, um, like if you were to plot the item characteristic surface of it, right, where you had theta 1 and theta 2, it would not be this nice smooth ogive in two dimensions. It would actually be curved in different ways. It causes all sorts of chaos in what we do. Did that answer did that I get yeah. you? Anybody else? I told you break at 150. I nailed it. All right, two o'clock, we'll start again with the discussion. And that ends the recording for this lecture.